thank you so much for coming. And we'd like to welcome everyone to Black Knowledge Matters today. And our special guest is filmmaker Rick Mathis. And uh, Rick Mathis is an independent visual story storyteller, adept in all areas of photojournalism and video production. As a former attendee of Fort Valley State University and alumni of Georgia State University, he acquired an educational background in music management and marketing. His appreciation for the artistic craftsmanship of lyricists led to his first visual production entitled Word, which featured the last poets, CeeLo Green, Sonia Sanchez, Amiri Baraka, and more. Rick Mathis is very passionate about giving back to the community. He has a history of over 10 years of working closely with the Atlanta Department of Education, agencies, and social service organizations to ensure community involvement and knowledge of community resources for various individuals served. He has taught therapeutic activities and provide family and individual counseling. Recently, he has garnered attention as, an, as executive director for the provocative documentary, Black Friday. What legacy will you leave? The documentary explores why African-Americans have consistently remained in the lowest percentile of America's wealth gap, while also presenting insight on how to restore the circulation of wealth in black communities. In addition, he has received praise for his video concepts for national and global brands, such as Walmart, um, is it Beijing? Is it, am I pronouncing that right? It's uh, it's actually pronounced the begin. It's the hair dye that uh, okay. a lot of people use. Uh, we did a lot of their campaign stuff. All right, begin, Pepsi, mm -hmm. uh, Essence Music Festival, 100 Black Men, Big Brothers, Big Sisters, and Home Depot. He looks forward to showcasing his creative talents in the realm of documentaries, reality shows, and movies. And just recently, he's uh, 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 collaborated with uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins to produce uh, a movie. I, I believe it's entitled B1. Is, is that is that correct? Oh, B1 the movie. B1 so one the familiar movie. With, yeah, if you're familiar with the uh, B1 movement, you definitely know what, what the film is. Well, without further ado, let's welcome Rick Mathis. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for having me. And uh, mm -hmm. Definitely want to thank Judy uh, for inviting me and the rest of the team, as well as uh, some of the other people that I know on here, Akina and, you know, some of the other people that's out representing ATL. But yeah, definitely excited to, uh, to be on here, man. Thanks for having me. Great, great, great that you came. Mm -hmm. So a um, little bit about me. Uh, I started my career as a storyteller, as uh, doing poetry, that's how I met Judy. And, uh, you know, we used to run around Atlanta uh, performing on all of the open mic circuits. You know, we had uh, some greats, man, like uh, Felipe, the philosopher, the prophet, and the poet. That's an old Atlanta legend, poet legend. You know, those who uh, back in the 90s may know who that is, Brother Kenneth Zaki. Uh, you know, had the opportunity to work with uh, some of the people that was on. Uh, HBO's Dell Poetry, such as uh, Georgia Me, uh, Abyss, Tommy Bottoms, you know, a lot of those, uh, a lot of those poets. And, um, you know, from there, I just pretty much took my, took my career to film because I knew, and this was back in 2000 and I want to say 2002 when we did Word, which was a poetry DVD series. Uh, that featured everybody from the last poets to Amir Baraka, Sonia Sanchez, uh, CeeLo from the Goody Mob. We had Professor Griff in there. So we just had a host of poets and uh, storytellers in there. So, uh, so during that time, you know, I created Word, the poetry DVD series, because after taking their poetry on Broadway and 
uh, managing some of the top poets on there and winning a Tony Award, a Peabody Award, uh, as well as an Emmy, and uh, presenting the Deaf Poetry uh, stage play on Broadway. We were on 42nd Street uh, in New York. I don't know if we have any New Yorkers in the building, but you can represent in the chat if you are in the, in the building. Is the chat on, the live chat? Yes, yes. Okay, so, uh, so yeah, so, you know, we were in New York on 42nd Street and took the play around around the world, literally. And uh, from there, I was like, well, what's next? So I started looking at the internet and, you know, film production. And I was like, well, once this internet can has the bandwidth to withstand, you know, streaming video, I say video is going to be a powerful thing. I don't know if y'all remember when uh, the internet first came out, it used to make that that sound like we was on the ocean, like, choo, choo. And then it was a ping, <laughs> and then you were online. I think that was what AOL. <laughs> hey, look, I may be telling my age, you know. I drank some good water down here in Atlanta, so I look like I'm young. But uh, but yeah, so I, I was like, wow, now once there's enough bandwidth for video, this is gonna be an amazing thing. And this was like in the early 2000s when uh, you know, when that vision came to me. So from there. We produce Word. I partner with the Emmy Award winner, and uh, we produce Word, the poetry DVD series, and we showcased a lot of Atlanta poets, you know, along with the uh, the legends in the game, you know, like the, uh, you know, Amir Barakas, the Last Poets, Adi Odun, who's you know a good friend of mine now. I often go up to Harlem and visit him, and uh, you know he hosts poetry readings at his house every Sunday. You know, prior to COVID, he was doing that. So, you know, I developed a great relationship with him as a result of a uh, word. And so after we, uh, after I produced word, you know, that started my career as a filmmaker. So on that particular project, I was more so uh, just producing because I didn't, uh, I didn't know how to shoot. <laughs> I didn't know how to edit, <laughs> but I knew how to tell a good story and I knew how to bring the, pre the uh, pieces together to produce it. So that's kind of where I got my uh, got my first start, you know. So I did that, and then from there, mm -hmm. uh, started with a magazine you all may know of, magazine called Rolling mm -hmm. Out Magazine. Y'all ever heard of that magazine? <laughs> so Rolling Out Magazine is based here in Atlanta, but it's uh, the number one weekly uh, black-owned publication in the U.S. So uh, Monson Steed is a good friend of mine. We're actually uh, working on something now. Uh, that we'll be presenting soon, you know, to uh, to the world. So uh, I started with, you know, rolling out magazine. And from there, you know, I start shooting and learn how to edit. And I, you know, was a supervising producer in the video department there. So we're bringing in interns that are actually going to school for film production. And uh, I'm learning from them. <laughs> so I'm the supervising producer. I'm, you know, overseeing the department. But at the same time, I'm learning. I'm like, what's the new apps? You know, what's what's new in uh, video production? What's new in this? So, you know, so I started getting that and uh, started learning, you know, my skill set and, you know, really started, you know, honing my craft there with storytelling. And, you know, right now, uh, content creation is the biggest thing going right now. So if you are selling anything, Right now, you need to create video content around whatever it is you're selling in order to sell it. You have to create video content around anything, you know. So brands are more so like media outlets now. So you have to create stories, you know, around your brand. So no matter what your brand is, if you're selling uh, shoes, if you're selling T-shirts, if you're selling, you know, jewel jewelry like copper jewelry or onks. You have to create a story around that, you know, around that brand, around that product and create video content around it, put it on social media. And that's really what's fueling, you know, the economy right now. So you might want to take notes, you know, on that. I also, uh, you know, offer classes on on content creation and pretty much how to how to tell a story. You know, I have a formula that I use in storytelling that uh, that really works. And you'll see a lot of that uh, in, when we show the trailer in uh, in Black Friday, if you've seen Black Friday, you'll see that in Black Friday 
as well as uh, B1, the movie, which is coming out with Dr. Boris Watkins. So, uh, so yeah, so from there, you know, we, uh, we produced Word, produced a couple of other films. And then uh, I said, you know what? I wanna go out here and produce a film series that's written, produced, and directed by Rick Mathis. So that film series was none other than Word, than, uh, not Word, than uh, Black Friday, the film Black Friday. So I wanna share the, uh, the trailer of the film Black Friday you know, for those who haven't seen it, this was a project that we released uh, back in 2015. So I was literally about, you know, five to seven years, I would say, you know, ahead of my time in terms of uh, releasing this project. Because when we released the project, Obama was in an office. He was, you know, the president. And I don't know if y'all felt it or not, but Nick Rose thought they had made it, <laughs> you know? They said, we finally got a black president in office. We done made it now, boy, we, we there. And then, you know, <laughs> he, he, he served his term, you know, and he, um, you know, did what he did, you know what I mean? And uh, after that, we got a man named Donald Trump. <laughs> and that's where the fire got lit on the black people. <laughs> So, you know, so we, uh, so at that point, like when Black Friday was released in 2015, it was like, uh, people received it, but I'm definitely going to re-release Black Friday because I think the ground now is more fertile for a film like Black Friday than when we, you know, we released it then. Like we had a great run. I mean, we screened it everywhere from Atlanta, which was the premiere, to Alaska, to Ghana. Like we screened the film, uh, the Bermuda, they screened it in Bermuda. We went to majority of the uh, major cities in the US screening the film, hosting panels, uh, hosting workshops. And uh, you know, it was, it, was really, uh, it was really received well. And I definitely think, you know, the people that supported that film and uh, help us take it to the world like we did. So, uh, so I would love to share that uh, that trailer right now, if we could. I don't know if you've uh, you you are a co-host. Okay, um, I'm co-host. I'm in the driver's seat. Got yes, it. go ahead. Got it. Let me do this. And uh, this is the first trailer um, for the first film, and this was a film series that I produced. Was th this was the first film of that series. And uh, this film featured everybody from, you know, like you say, Dr. Claude Anderson to, uh, to David Banner, to Dr. Boyce Watkins, to uh, who else was in this film? Man, we had, uh, who else did we have? David Banner, we had, uh, I'm drawing a blank now. Oh, we had Mike Roberts, the billionaire out of St. Louis. We had, we had a host of people. Professor James Smalls was in the series. Like we had really the all-star cast. We had Dr. George Frazier. Man, and this has been, uh, when the first uh, installment was released, that was in 2015. So it's been seven years. So we really coming up on a, uh, on a 10 year anniversary for uh, the Black Friday film series. So this was, um, this was the very first film that we released. And it starts with a profound question. You know, I had my nine-year-old niece ask this question. And uh, so I put it in the film because it was very, uh, very profound for, uh, for a nine-year-old, you know. So I present to you the trailer for uh, the film Black Friday. If you died right now, would you leave bills or benefits? I'm going to leave behind benefits. Bills? Well, I'll leave both. Benefits and bills. Benefits. And bills. I leave shoes, jewelry. I got a little something saved. I got an insurance policy, but I got some, I got some bills, too. That's a funny question. As a child, my family did not teach me about money because we didn't really have a lot of money growing up. We didn't have a lot, a lot of conversations about it other than, is it possible I can get a nickel or a dime or a quarter? 
So we didn't realize we were being tricked to be a consumer. And to this day, some of us are still consumers because we're still trying to be fresh. Louis Vuitton don't want black folks in their clothes. Gucci don't want black folks in their clothes. But we kill ourselves to go give the people that hate us the most our money. We're just kind of living and we're doing it and going on, but not really taking um, close inventory of what we're spending. Listen, sisters, I love me some rare bottoms just like the next person, but I think it is absolutely ignorant and insane and crazy to be more focused on getting another pair of rare bottom shoes when you don't even have a rare bottom bank account. And these kids running around the internet beating each other up for world star. You got all this other stuff that you got to worry about, but they don't sit down and say, this is a dollar, this is a quarter, this is a dime, this is a nickel. And, and that's what I think the issue is. So if I don't know myself, you give me a billion dollars, I'll act like I don't know who the f I am. I'm gonna be in the strip club and throw it away. Everybody on Instagram appears rich, particularly to the rest of the world. Black people, we are the single richest African community on the face of the globe. And it makes absolutely no sense that we have poverty. Uh, in 1910, for instance, we own, uh, uh, we own more businesses per 100,000 African Americans than we do today. Because right now, 99% of the blacks are the resource in the countries under the hands of whites. 87% of it is frozen, locked into their hands. So how, how are black folk gonna compete? Living in America, I've witnessed very small portions of land and wealth be transferred from one generation to the next. With $1.1 trillion in buying power, what's prohibiting our team from pooling our talents and winning in society? And see, the problem is we get paid on Friday, get drunk on Saturday, go to church on Sunday, and then go back to work on Monday. We can say it's the the best of times and the worst of times, we're a $1.1 trillion annual economy. If we were a nation, we'd be the 16th richest nation in the entire world. We've been taught the wrong things about money. We've been taught that money is a result rather than what it really is, is a tool. If I would have understood that early on at a younger age, I would have been way further along in my career than, you know, things just now started to happen. What can we do to ensure that we're leaving a legacy for our children? Make sure that you are surrounding yourself with people that have the information and the knowledge of what you need in order to grow to the next level. We need to make sure that you do have something so your children don't have to start at ground zero again when you right. pass away. That's or right. even negative from having to put you in the ground. That's right. right. That's right. So yeah, that was the film Black Friday. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So uh, as you can see, I left a lot of people that, uh, that I did name that are featured in the film. So we will be uh, releasing that film again soon. And uh, what we're doing now is we're creating NFTs around these film projects. So I'm actually learning about, you know, that whole process because that's a whole, that's a whole universe, <laughs> you know, that's parallel to this universe that's being created, a whole digital universe, you know. So I've been learning about it, but there's still a lot of stuff, you know, that I need to learn about, you know, NFTs. And, you know, people are making a lot of money, you know, with these NFTs right now. So uh, excuse me, excuse me. Can I ask a question? Sure. Uh, actually, I have two questions. Sure. Uh, and and I'm I'm so glad that I'm fine out finding out about it now i was not familiar with it what has been the impact uh, you know since you've released that film what has been the impact that you've noticed man i mean i've seen uh people come and watch the film and from watching the film they've created like the guy who uh sharif who created we buy black he was at the film screening and he was inspired to uh to start we buy black um there's a young lady here in Atlanta that's doing something called the Village Market. She was inspired after coming to a film screening uh, from the film Black Friday. So, I mean, the impact from this film has been amazing because the thing is, you know, more people will watch a video than they will read a book. 
You know, you have especially young people, like you have more people that are sitting in front of the screen and watch that where they're getting all of this profound information as opposed to opening a book and reading, you know, a hundred page book or even a 50 page book, you know? So, um, so it's, it's been impactful in that, you know, we've been able to educate people through the medium of video, you know, just using video as a tool, you know, to educate people has been, you know, the most amazing part about, uh, about producing the film Black Friday. Um, you mentioned the term um, or the letters NFTs. What, mm -hmm. what does that stand for? So NFTs, NFTs are non-fungible tokens. And what non-fungible tokens is, it's, um, I like to describe a non-fungible token as a digital baseball card. So if you think about a baseball card, right? I don't know how many baseball card uh, collectors do we have out there? Do we have any baseball, any people that collect baseball cards? So if you think about a baseball card, right? Uh, when they create, you know, the Hank Aaron baseball card, they created maybe a hundred of those and they put them in, I think it was tops was the baseball cards that was collected. So they put those in cards throughout those packages and they put them in different ones. So that's what you would think of an NFT as. You would think of an NFT as a baseball, a digital baseball card that, you, that you're collecting. So with the NFT, the NFT sits on what's called the blockchain. And the blockchain is more so a ledger that records every process or every exchange that's taken. So the NFT, which could be this digital baseball card or this digital image, a cell phone, would you say a cell phone, we created this as an NFT. This becomes a digital item that now sits on the blockchain. And what it, what it does is you have to have what's called a wallet. And this item would sit in your wallet on the blockchain. And, uh, and then your, that, that wallet, depending on how much attention or how much is garnered around that, how much attention is garnered around this item, you know, black people always set the trends anyway and make things cool. So depending on how much attention is based on this item, this NFT, that determines the value. That determines, you know, how much people are gonna pay for it. So, uh, so basically, you know, a certain amount of these NFTs, which is non-fungible tokens, tokens that uh, can't be uh, counterfeited or can't be uh, duplicated without you know, outside of whatever the duplication amount is. So, uh, so that, you know, that's what NFTs are, but I would encourage each and every one of you all to look into it. Uh, it's definitely a learning curve, but once you learn, once you have that learning curve and you start to understand it, then, you know, there's a boatload of money that can be made uh, off of, you know, the NFTs, whether you're creating your own NFTs or you're participating in, uh, in somebody else's NFTs. But more so uh, when you create these communities, uh, these NFT communities, you create what's called a smart contract. So the thing with a smart contract, it's a contract wherein if this cell phone is created as an NFT, this cell phone right here is created as an NFT. If I sell this cell phone to somebody else, the person that created this cell phone or the artist they'll get paid too every time this particular NFT sells. So they get paid and it's nothing where that anybody has to do. So when you create that smart contract, it's automatically gonna pay you to your wallet when that NFT is sold. You know what I'm saying? So it's, it's amazing that, um, you know, what's, taking, what's happening and what's taking place in this metaverse because it's a whole digital world where you can go in and you can buy land. I'm sure y'all have heard about it. People are buying land and houses and, you know, they got yachts sitting on boats and NFTs. They're buying art. They're actually buying clothing to actually wear in, in this metaverse world. So, you know, it's a digital world, but the thing is, you know, a lot of people may be afraid of it, but I say, we got to learn how to use this 
uh, for us and to benefit us versus having it use us and benefit the metaverse. You know, we need to be, you know, the first to create it and the first to get paid from it instead of being the first to create it and the last to get paid from it. You know, like we have been, you know, for so many years, if you look at all the inventions and all the things, you know, that black people have created. We've been the first to create it, but the last to benefit financially from it. And if we get on the forefront, this is something that we can get on the forefront of, which is why we're creating these NFTs around this new film, B1, the movie, that will have NFTs, you know, created around it. And, um, you know, we could really, uh, you know, set our own trends and make a lot of be a trailblazer in it and make it work for us. You know, we can't be afraid of the technology. We just got to jump in front of it, understand what it is and make it work for us. So in short, that's what an NFT is. I wanted to explain the NFT, the metaverse, which the NFT, the NFT will live in along with your wallet, uh, along with your di digital wallet, and as well as uh, the blockchain, which is the foundation that NFTs sit on. So you need to look up those three things. What's an NFT? What is the metaverse? And what is the blockchain? Look up those three things and, uh, and get engaged, you know, have fun with it. Don't bet the house starting out, but, you know, bet a dollar or two and, you know, buy your NFT and, uh, and see what happens, you know? You might make some money, you might lose some money, but at the end of the day, guess what? You learn the process, you're learning the system. Thank so you. Thank you. Is, is it any way associated with Bitcoins? Yes. Yeah, so Bitcoins is what you buy. That was the other part I left out, which is something else that you need to look up. So NFTs can cannot. Well, there's one platform now that you can purchase NFTs with your debit card. But most of the platforms that you purchase NFT is purchased in a uh, it's like a Bitcoin. It's called Ethereum. It's purchased in Ethereum. And um, yeah, so it's like that. So, and some people create, you know, uh, you know, coins, you know, to purchase, you know, um, NFTs with, to purchase, you know, digital, uh, digital NFTs with. So, yeah, so that's, uh, that's what you have to purchase the NFTs in what's called Ethereum. Thank you. Thank you. So you have to log in and convert your money from dollars to ethereum and that's what you purchase your nfts thank you you have to look at the exchange rate so it's really like you know it's really like a whole new cool phenomenon that's happening mm -hmm. are there any other questions uh before uh, uh brother i thought uh, it was another question i know they wanted to know nfts and then it was something else i think you had two questions i don't know if yeah you, and you answered them uh oh, okay okay yeah, yeah you answered oh. them. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, so uh, the film Black Friday. So the film Black Friday was released in October, I believe it was. No, it was November, November of 2015. I released it on my birthday. It was November uh, 2015. So, um, so with that, after we released, uh, you know, the film Black Friday, you know, we had the opportunity to take this film literally around the world. And, you know, we had a lot of different people uh, host this film around the world. And the first place that we took it was Columbus, Ohio. And as faith would have it, uh, Columbus, Ohio is going to be the first place that I go to show snippets of B1, the movie. We're not showing the entire film, but because it won't be released. Uh, in May when we'll be in uh, Columbus, but it'll be one of the first places that I go to actually show uh, to show snippets of, you know, B1, the movie. I'm show a few clips and, uh, you know, really the NFTs that are, that'll be created around the film. Because the other thing about NFTs is you can actually take a 30 second video clip from a film, turn that into an NFT and people will buy it. Because think about it this way, right? Do y'all remember the movie Do the Right Thing with Spike yes. Lee? Yes. So uh, what if you had the 30-second NFT 
from the movie Do the Right Thing, where uh, Radio Raheem uh, was carrying his box and he was like, Radio Raheem like a mug. You know, remember when he said that in the film, like that classic line? So what if you had the 30 second NFT of that? What if you had the NFT poster from Do the Right Thing and there were only 10 of them that were sold? So you would be one of 10 people that has this Do the Right Thing movie poster. You know what I mean? What if you had uh, an NFT that was created around the movie The Color Purple? <laughs> you know, when, uh, you know, and there's some classic lines in The Color Purple. So, you know, just think about those classic lines, those classic sound bites, and you actually own that 30 second NFT. You know, that would be worth a lot of money. So that's how you have to look at, you know, the films that's being created and the things that's being created now. Really, it's more so like being an art collector. And uh, collecting art is one of the ways that people actually uh, preserve their wealth. So they'll put their wealth in, you know, collecting art. So this is really a way that you can actually uh, preserve your wealth and store your wealth because nine times out of 10 with those hit movies, uh, the value is only going to go up. Um, now, in order to see your films, uh, are, are, can you do you see them online? Are they on Netflix? Do you have to go in the theaters? How how are they viewed? Well, actually, what I did, I uh, I actually took them offline because what I'm looking to do is actually set up a uh, distribution platform so that you can come and see my film as well as uh, other films that independent filmmakers have created. So uh, so you'll be hearing more about that soon. But I actually took them down and we'll actually re-release uh, the film Black Friday series. Right now, what I do is, you know, I sell them as a, uh, as a DVD. So if you want to purchase a DVD, I still sell those. But uh, it isn't in a digital form right now because I wanted to uh, kind of hit the reset button and uh, just kind of start over in terms of uh, releasing that content. All right. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the audience? Uh, don't let me ho hog it. <laughs> Go ahead, Ikena. Okay, greetings, Rick. Wonderful to hey, see you. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> All is wonderfully well. Good, uh, okay. good to see you. Wonderful to see you and we'll say family. Um, so I remember a little while back, you had a, pro um, a promotion going for young people. Um, it was some type of a youth contest. So yeah, I just young wonder, money makers. Yeah, what are you doing now in terms of um, working with the youth, the young folks around economic development or filmmaking or yeah, other? Good, good question. So, uh, so as you'll see tonight, uh, I'll share the 60 second trailer with you all of B1, the movie uh, that I'm partnering with uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Boyce Watkins on. And uh, you know, once we release this film, in the next coming months. Uh, I'll actually uh, start working with young people again in, in terms of uh, having them pitch their ideas, their films, uh, their digital content, because you know the, these, uh, these young people grew up with one of these in their hand, a cell phone. <laughs> they grew up in front of these computers. So, you know, uh, and that's all they know. Like they don't know a world without, you know, you gotta think if you are, you know, 20, 25, you don't know a world where there wasn't a cell phone. You know, just think about that for a minute. Where we know when it was pre-cell phones and now where we are now, post-cell phones, you know, uh, they, 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 they don't know a world without cell phones. So they're able to create content and tell stories by using these cell phones <laughs> that, uh, you know, that is jaw-dropping. So I'll definitely be working with uh, young people on, you know, and helping them to uh, tell their story as well as, you know, have some friendly competitions, you know, around storytelling and filmmaking. So that's what we'll be doing in the new future. And we'll probably do it under the, the uh, brand of Young Money Makers. We had a question, uh, do you have a website? Yeah, so I'm rebuilding the website. I do have uh, rickmathis.com. So I'm actually rebuilding it. But uh, right now, if you want to contact me, uh, definitely reach me. I'll put it in the chat here on Instagram or Facebook. 
any other social media platforms uh, at Rick Mathis. And that's Rick Mathis without the K. R I C Mathis, M A T H I S without the K. Let me ask you uh, we have a question here that uh, is asking when you showed your film Black Friday in 2015, did you come to the West Coast? Definitely, man. And we are you are you planning to do the same with B1? Oh yeah, okay. definitely, man. We blazed the West Coast. We were in Sacramento, we were in Oakland, we were in uh, San Francisco, LA. We did uh, the Caress House in LA. Uh, we did, uh, what's the bookstore there on uh, Long Beach? The bookstore was- S.O.1. Yeah. Yeah, so, that's Shades of Africa. Shades of Africa is yeah, in. Shades of Africa. That's oh, right. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, we yeah we were at Shades of Africa. So yeah, we uh yeah we definitely were on the West Coast. Like when I tell you we took this film everywhere, like we took this film a lot of places, like literally and multiple times. Like we uh we we went to Oakland a couple of times to uh, what is that the Black Theater in Oakland? It's a red building. It's the place where uh, Paul Mooney and all of them used to perform all of the, the uh, comics. I forget the name of it, but it's in. it was in Oakland. And we did uh, One Stop. There's a place called One Stop in Oakland that uh, that we went to. So yeah, we, uh, we definitely toured the West Coast with it. Are you coming again? Definitely, definitely. We would love to come. We're definitely gonna bring uh, B1 the movie. Okay, uh, we'll say. Yeah, yeah, we need. Yeah, we, we need to be there. When, when oh, yeah, yeah. I definitely let you all know. So follow me at uh, on, on Instagram at Rick Mathis. Definitely go there. Follow me as well as uh, the Facebook page, Rick Mathis. And uh, and that's where we'll share a lot of the information as well about, um, you know, about the new film. We also will have, you know, the new websites that are linked to uh, the NFTs and the uh, and the wallets. The digital wallets. All right. Are there any other questions uh, before uh, Brother Rick proceeds? Any other questions? All right. Uh, please continue. We're enjoying every minute of this. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, screening uh, Black Friday before you basically arranged private screenings and your own yes. fee structure tickets, etc., at various venues, and just took it with your own team around the country, right? Exactly, so uh, so we did it a few different ways. So we had a uh, promotional tour that we did, and then we uh, had the Black Friday film series tour. And uh, also people, uh, you, we, people purchased screening license. We just had someone uh, purchase a screening license in St. Louis and um, what is it called? Uh, I can't think of the name of the organization, uh, Urban League. Urban League, someone at Urban League St. Louis just purchased a screening license to uh, to host a film screening in St. Louis. So, you know, so we have screening license that can be purchased where you can host your own film screening and, you know, you can have it shown for free. You can uh, sell tickets if you like, have a vendor's market around it, uh, a panel discussion afterwards. So, you know, it's a, it's a great way to get uh, an audience together if you have a product to sell, if you have a service to sell, a lot of uh, insurance companies used to um, they used to uh, get screening license and show the film to to sell insurance products because one of the things that we talked about in the film was actually having you know life insurance you know and the importance of that you know and how life insurance is one of the number one ways that wealth is transferred you know I don't know if people know that or not. But you know, through life insurance, that's how wealth is transferred. Whether you have a a, a whole life insurance policy, you know, a index universal life insurance policy, you know, that's how wealth is transferred through that. You know, so uh, so that was one of the things that people would uh, would do. We created a T-shirt that says uh, "Insure for one million dollars, don't shoot." You know, a lot of when a lot of the uh, you know, a lot of the people, our brothers and sisters was getting killed at the hands of, of police. You know, I created that shirt that was inspired uh, when the gentleman got killed in Dallas. And uh, so really, you know, I've, I've been just using uh, the film Black Friday as a big commercial. You know, it's really a big commercial to uh, market and promote the things that are near and dear to my heart. 
So when you're creating a documentary, when you're creating digital content, look at it as such. You know, with any uh, content creation, it's like a commercial. It's a digital commercial that you can create, tell a well-written and produced story, put it on a uh, social media platform, and that content will live there forever. Just think about, about that. Content lives forever. About how much um, investment uh, would you say is involved in the production of, of, of films like yours? Wow. Well, uh, with the first when we produced Black Friday, um, when I went back and looked at the numbers, I was like, "Woo, man, we spent a lot of money on this film. But, you know, we 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 ended up making a lot of money and it was a great uh, promotional tool. But I mean, it, it really varies. I mean, uh, it's really based on, you know, the size of the cast, the amount of locations that you have, your production team, and basically like your skill set. So if I had to put a value on uh, the dollar amount that it costs to produce Black Friday, it was around seventy thousand that uh, that I that that I spent on producing Black Friday too. Because in that, uh, the locations, like we toured the world in Black Friday too, and I can show y'all that uh, trailer as well. But uh, we toured the world. I mean, we shot scenes in Ghana. We shot scenes in Spain. We went to uh, Barcelona. And we actually went to see the Black Madonna. Like when you watch Black Friday too, you'll see the Black Madonna in the film Black Friday too, where uh, people literally stand in line for hours to go into the church to what, pay what, what what location is that so this is in barcelona spain it's in uh, a space it's in a place that's like right outside of barcelona spain it's maybe it took me about a uh i want to say an hour train ride from barcelona to montserrat montserrat is where uh the black madonna is so you literally go get on a train downtown barcelona i show all of this in the film you know, you get on the train downtown Barcelona, you take the train ride to Montserrat. And from there, uh, you take a cable car up in the mountains. And there's this big cathedral church up wow. in the mountains, like it's amazing. And from there, you stand in this long line for hours. Like we literally got there before it opened. And the line, I think I may have had to stand in the line uh, two hours or something like that but you literally stand in the line for hours and then you go inside the church and there you see you know in the pulpit this black madonna and you walk up the pulpit and she has like a ball in her hand and you can actually touch the ball and uh you know when you come out you um people you know make prayers to her and um and then they light candles, like they sell candles and things of that nature. But it really shows uh, our contribution on this planet. It really shows our worth, our value, you know, who we are as Black people. You know, people around the world really, you know, are worshiping us and uh, the accomplishments and the, the legacy that we've laid. You know, so... People know who we are. It's just that, you know, we don't know who we are, but we're waking up to who we are and we're waking up to, you know, to our, our powers, our superpower. You know, you got to think uh, in, in the film uh, B1, the movie, one of the questions that I ask is, uh, why do other races feel threatened when Black people simply talk about putting Black people first? Why do other races feel threatened when we simply talk about it? Oh, y'all can't put y'all self first. You know, black lives matter, white lives matter too, blue lives matter too. We know that, but we are the ones that uh, are being disenfranchised. We are the ones that, you know, have for the past 400 years uh, endured a certain amount of, uh, of, 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 of theft of, uh, of our legacies being stolen, our land being stolen, and our language being stolen. You know, just think about that for a minute. We don't even speak the language of our native tongue, you know, that was passed down. You know, if you go back four or five generations, there was a different language 
that we spoke, whether we came from Africa or whether we were already here in the Americas. We didn't speak English, you know, just going back five to six generations back. You know what I mean? So we were stripped of our land. We were stripped of our legacy. We were stripped of our language. You know what I mean? So now being that all of that has happened, now we're waking up to who we really are. So, you know, so seeing the film, it actually, you know, shows that by going to uh, see the Black Madonna in Spain, it actually shows, you know, uh, it shows those things. It shows our greatness. It shows our power. You know, right now, Black people are in style, you know, everybody, hey, you know, throwing up the Black fist, you know what I mean? Uh, celebrating Blackness. Everybody, you know, white people are feeling guilty and giving guilt money, <laughs> you know, to Black organizations. You know what I mean? So, you know, we're in style. And the reason why is because it's our time. The clock and the, you know, the, the, the ties have shifted. You know, the clock has, has struck 12. We're in a different dimension now. We're in a different age now. And it's our time to rise again. So, you know, all we have to do is stand in our power and recognize who we are and we're gonna flourish. That's why other races feel threatened because they know the power that we possess. They know, you know, our mightiness, you know, they know who we are. So, yeah. So they know all of these things. So when knowing these things, you know, that's what happens. So that's my sermon for tonight. Sister okay. Akena has a question. <laughs> she has her hand up. Go ahead. Okay, go ahead. Um, yes, when you just spoke about language, it just made me think about what does it take to have um, your movies, your videos translated into our other languages, either with wow. captions or voiceovers? That's a good question. I think uh, I think we can do it in captions uh, really easy. And uh, that could be done in, 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 a, in a Premiere program, program called Premiere, which is a video editing program. That probably would be the, the simplest way uh, in terms of having someone else uh, actually do a voiceover with it. Yeah, that would be an uh, a interesting process to actually have that done. Premiere does the voice recognition and creates the text? Yeah, that's what Premiere does. Yep, there's a feature on there that uh, recognizes your voice and it will, uh, it will transcribe it for you. It will put the closed captions uh, at the bottom of the video. Are there so any other questions? Yeah, that's a jewel right there. So if you, you know, if you're a filmmaker out there and you're watching this, uh, a lot of times, you know, they charge uh, per minute to have your uh, film closed caption, but now you can actually do that in Premiere for free. Well, I would like to say something, Rick, this is Judy. Um, mm -hmm. Well, you know, I went to the Premiere, I was invited. Uh, to the premiere of Black Friday, the first mm -hmm. film, and it was just such, oh my God, it was such a gala and wonderful, huge Thank event, you. lots of people um, and celebrities, Les Brown's daughter was hosting, and it, it was just wonderful, and you're doing some tremendous work um, in the community. You, you mentioned also about your, did, it, did I hear you mention that you have a um, class that you're teaching or something, or not necessarily you teaching, but a well, program. I, yeah, I have, yeah, I have, so it's a few different things. So I offer a uh, content promotion uh, class or uh, consultation, if you will, uh, that takes you through the four steps of production. It takes you through pre-production. It takes you through uh, pre-production, which is actually writing, brainstorming, and coming up with your script. Your script is actually, you know, the main part of any production because, you know, that's going to tell the story. And uh, I always say you start with the end in mind first. So if you're writing a script, know where that script is going to live. Know what distribution platform is going to be on. Are you shooting for Netflix with this? Are you shooting for a TV network? Are you shooting for the big screen? Know where it's going to live down to, you know, the exact place where it's going to live, because that is going to determine what uh what items or what elements are comprised in the film because uh there are elements in the film called tropes and tropes are just things that you would expect to see in a in a film or in a production 
So if there was a film about uh, somebody going to war, what would be some of the tropes you would expect to see in that film? You would expect to see uh, some gun battles. You would expect to see someone writing letters back to their family, you know, their loved ones. You know, there are certain things that you would expect to see in the script or in the story of that film. And those are called tropes. So, uh, so that's the first part, so, which is storytelling. So know before you even produce the film, what road you're gonna travel down, that's pre-production. Uh, the next phase would be production, actually shooting it. Uh, know what kind of cameras you're gonna use, what type of uh, lighting you're gonna use, you know, those types of things, uh, lenses, filters, you know, backdrops, things of that nature that you're gonna use. That's the production of the film. Uh, Post-production is uh, actually the editing of the film. Are you gonna use motion graphics? Uh, what editing software are you gonna use to, uh, to edit this film? Uh, where can I find images that are royalty free, that are copyright free, uh, so that you don't have copyright infringements on? Where can I find video that's copyright free so that I don't have copyright infringements? Uh, know what, what, what is under uh, the fair use doctrine, which is uh, images and how much you could use in a film uh, so that you don't infringe on a copyright. You know, know the parameters of that. That's what I talk about uh, in, these, uh, in this particular consultation. And then the last thing is distribution. Where would your project live? What do you want your project to live after it is produced? You know, how do you uh, want to monetize your product? Are you monetizing your product in the beginning? Like when I produced Black Friday 2, before I released the film, I had already made money. You know, I had already, you know, made probably about $25,000, $30,000 before I released Black Friday 2, you know, without the first ticket sale. So how do you do that? So, uh, so those are the type of things that I, that I talk about in, in, in the class. So, uh, so now what I'll be doing is I'll actually be uh, creating a master's class though, which I'm dealing with content creation, which uh, filmmaking has a slot within that umbrella of content creation. So we'll talk about filmmaking. We'll talk about creating a YouTube video. You know, I had the opportunity to, uh, produce a lot of Les Brown's videos. And from producing his content, I learned how to craft my signature message. I learned certain formulas and techniques, you know, that he uses that, uh, that can be applied or that should be applied uh, in storytelling. You know, in storytelling, when you're crafting your message, there's a certain rhythm, there's a certain cadence that people listen to. So when you're listening to somebody, there's a certain cadence that you want to, uh, that you want to kind of speak in. So it's different things that, um, you know, that I share in, in those classes and then I'll be sharing, you know, in the, in the master classes, so. Wow, that is awesome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I'm ready to see some of the other trailers too. Okay, so, uh, so are there any other questions? I'll share, uh, B1 the movie, this is the 60 second uh, trailer that we really haven't released yet. So I'm gonna give you all a sneak peek of this, uh, of this 60 second trailer. And uh, this trailer features uh, Riza Islam. It features, I know the West Coast people can appreciate him. <laughs> it features uh, Nuri Muhammad, Queen of Four, uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins, and uh, young up and coming uh, actress, that's probably, I think she's about 11 years old. So she's, uh, she's actually making some big headway in uh, a lot of films. So if there isn't a, a, a question right now, uh, I will allow you all to see this film. This film, uh, like I said, it, it features Nuri Muhammad, Riza Islam, uh, Queen of Four, uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins, uh, D1, the uh, rap artist. It also features, uh, who else do we have in there? Jewel Tankard is, is featured in there. Dr. Claude Anderson is also featured in this one. Uh, we have just a host of, you know, B1, people that have been doing it, you know, for a while. And uh, we're actually, you know, giving them recognition and highlighting them uh, in this film project, so. Well, before you, show, I'm sorry, before you show it, Rick, um, mm -hmm. um, what is B1? You mentioned, for those so, of us who know what B1 is. 
Okay, so B1 is simply black first. So Boyce Watkins has this platform or has this thing where uh, before he starts any of his uh, speeches, he always say, you know, B1, put B1 in the chat. And B1 simply means on this platform, we'll put in black first, you know, because uh, we've been putting everybody else first. So now, when you know, when you come to this platform, it's about us putting black first, period without no apologies, unapologetically black. You know, it's time for us to put us first, you know, because we deserve it. You know, and, and it starts with this simple question. And we shouldn't even have to ask this question, but it starts with, you know, what is it going to take for black people to start putting black people first? That's the question that we start with. So, I love it. So yeah, I see Bill has uh, has his hair, hand raised. Uh, did you have a question, Bill? Yes, yeah, sir. Black Friday screening license is still available. If so, yeah. on what terms? Excuse me. At, on what terms? At what prices? Uh, so if you send me a message, it's different prices uh, based on if you have a nonprofit, if you you know if you're just doing a, a screening. But uh, you know they start as low as fifty dollars and they go up to around seven hundred and fifty dollars. Oh. Great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great project for Will Say. <laughs> it does. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to share this uh, this 60 second clip for uh, for B1 the movie, which is Black First, and uh, in this you'll definitely notice that uh, the production quality has evolved. You know, we we've gotten a lot better. Uh, from, you know, the film Black Friday, which was, you know, seven years ago. This one is, you know, shot in 4K quality. So, you know, it's, uh, I'm really, uh, really excited about it and really, uh, you know, happy with, with the turnout. So I share with you all, uh, B1, this is, uh, this is, a, hold on, this is a project that that will be released in this trailer, will be releasing really soon. There's an exciting movement happening amongst Black Americans. We're just trying to put each other first. I'm Dr. Boyce Watkins of the Black Business School. I've teamed up with award-winning filmmaker Rick Mathis to poll over one million people with this intriguing question. What is it going to take for black people to start putting black people first? No Arab, no Jew, no white man has ever had to be asked such a question. Nobody complains when an Indian man says he loves that Indian woman. Nobody complains when a Jewish man says I want to do business with my Jewish brethren. Nobody says a damn thing when a Chinese man says I only want to patronize Chinese businesses. The whole world is black power. And as long as black power is suffering, then we all want everybody going to be suffering. Putting black first means creating it first and being the first to profit from it. When you know your worth, you'll stop giving people discounts. So that's the 60 second for uh, B1 and B1 will be coming to the screens really, really soon. Uh, we are excited about B1. And uh, yeah, you can see, you know, the production quality has, uh, we've stepped that up, you know, along with, uh, you know, telling the story, our storytelling skills. So, yeah. you know, I'm really excited about it. I mean, when you, you know, when you, uh, when you see this project, you're going to be like, wow, you know, it's entertaining, it's thought provoking, you know, it's edgy, it's definitely uh, unapologetically black. You know, we're, we're putting us first and we're making no bones about it. You know what I mean? So, and, it, and it's time, you know what I mean? It's time that we start putting us first and that we start, you know, doing for self and actually, uh, you know, building our own communities. Um, you know, one of the scenes you'll see in there is actually me, uh, you know, going to Freedom Georgia and actually looking at land, you know, to buy in Freedom Georgia. I don't know if you all are familiar with Freedom Georgia, but Freedom Georgia is, a town in Georgia that uh, 19 black families came together and they bought uh, almost 500 acres of land. So they actually have a few more plots that they're selling 
but uh, they came together and they bought these 500 acres of land and uh, they're building their own town. You know, everything from growing their own food to educating their own kids to, uh, to uh, having, uh, you know, self-defense classes as well. You know, so them uh, being, you know, you know, doing rifle classes, martial arts classes, you know, so just really building a, a, a community that's off the grid and that they can sustain, you know, themselves. So that's what uh, that's what Freedom Georgia and there are a few of them that are in the uh, surrounding areas of Atlanta. Uh, there's also one Somerville uh, that's also like north of, of, of Atlanta that uh, Brother Ben X and uh, Marlena and uh, uh, what's the name Farrakhan Ali, Brother Farrakhan Ali. They came together and they've purchased over 1,200 uh, acres of land. You know what I mean? So, you know, it's it's some exciting things happening right now when it's time that uh, you know, we start doing for self and 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 you know, living off the grid and you know, being able to grow our own food. I mean, I don't know if you've noticed or not, but when we grow in these grocery stores right now, a lot of times the shelves are empty. <laughs> you know what I mean? And some of the grocery stores, the shelves are empty. So just think about that for a minute. If you can't go to the grocery store and you can't, you know, go, uh, go and, and buy food, you know, what are you going to do? You know, one of the questions that I ask in the film is, you know, do you and your family have uh, enough resources, enough skill set to survive another pandemic? You may think that that's, you know, are there never be another pandemic like, you know, the coronavirus, but who knows? You know, we're in some very uh, interesting times right now. It's a lot of things happening. So, you know, when you have people losing power, they get real desperate and real creative. So, you know, so those are some of the things that you really, you know, have to, uh, have, have to think about, you know, how would me and my family survive can we survive? Do we have the skill set? Do we have the resources to survive another pandemic? I have uh, a, another. Rick, could you share the not whenever it's appropriate? Could you also share your Black Friday two trailer? Yes. I yeah, I'll, I'll pull it up now. Let me whenever, pull it up. Now. Whenever it's time, not not rushing. Yet. I don't know what your presentation entails. Oh yeah, yeah, we yeah we we'll, we'll definitely share it. Uh, did anybody else have any other? Any other questions? I'll pull up the uh, B12 trailer as well. And this was the one that we, uh, this was the one that we, I share two different things from a house one. or a laptop. This was the one that we, uh, that we did when we actually went to Spain and we actually went to Ghana. We also went to uh, to Mexico. We went to the pyramids in Mexico, and uh, there was it was something that that was really amazing that happened uh, while we were in Mexico. Uh, when we climbed to the top of of the pyramids in Mexico, a rainbow appeared, and it wasn't raining. Wow! That, and you actually see it in the film, like a rainbow appeared in the uh in the sky because you know once we got to the top of the to the uh pyramid we were in uh we were in coba coba mexico which is uh probably about oh it's a few hours south of cancun because we were there for a film screening <laughs> believe it or not we screened the film in uh in cancun mexico where it was in maya riviera which is maya riviera is about 45 minutes south of cancun and then Coba is further south. So we rented a probably a 15 passenger cargo van and we rode down to the pyramids and you know we rode bikes through the woods. And uh, they had these, uh, I forgot, you'll see them in the film. I think they're two person bikes or, oh no, no, it wasn't. It was, yeah, it was two person pedal uh, bicycles but then there was a person on the back that was pedaling. So it was actually three people uh, on these yellow bicycles going through, you know, the jungle of Mexico up to the pyramids. 
So, you know, and, you know, people of color built that stuff. You know what I mean? People that look like us built all of that. And we have a legacy right here in the Americas that is, you know, amazing. One thing, uh, you know, right here in Atlanta, Georgia, mm -hmm. uh, Stone Mountain. Stone Mountain is a very, it's the largest exposed granite rock in the world. Granite is what? Granite is crystal. So it's an, actually a stone. So therefore people use crystals to charge energy, to attract energy. So if you think about that, I think <laughs> that's one of the things that make Atlanta special because of that granite rock that's right there. You know, the, it's the largest exposed granite rock in the world that, you know, it's thousands of feet above sea level in Atlanta, but it also goes, you know, uh, down in, in, in the earth. You know, and I learned this, they have a, uh, they have a quarry uh, museum. There used to be a rock quarry at Stone Mountain. So they've shipped granite all over the United States from right here in Stone Mountain, Georgia. Wow, wow. You know, just think about that for a minute. They've shipped granite all over the U.S. Now, if you know anything about granite, the pyramids are made out of granite rock. You know what I'm saying? If I've, I've had the opportunity to go to Egypt and see some of those big slabs that, you know, were used to build the pyramids. And so when you go to Stone Mountain, there's a museum there and there is a 66,000, is it pounds or tons? I think it was pounds, because I wanted to know how much is that in tons. It's either tons or pounds. I don't remember which one it was. I got to go back and look at it. Because I actually do you know, my five-mile run around Stone Mountain now, because it's actually a charge that I get when I'm running around Stone Mountain from being there around that crystal that energy. That's why, you know, the, the KKKs had their headquarters there. You know, see, and a lot of people know our traditions. They know our magic. They know how to ignite certain powers. <laughs> so they use it for their, for their good. But now, you know, we're at a time now where we're waking up, you know, and that junk DNA, as they call it, <laughs> is now starting to be activated. And uh, we'll be able to use that, you know what I mean? So, so the uh, so the uh, so the granite rock is actually, you know, it's a it, it's a special stone. It's a really a, a crystal. It's really a crystal. So that's the largest exposed granite rock in the world. And then an hour north of Atlanta, there's a small town called Elberton which is where the Georgia God, uh, Guidestones are built. And if you are familiar, if you don't know about the Georgia Guidestones, look up the Georgia Guidestones because they talk about, you know, the population reduction and all of that, which is what I feel is happening right now. But that's a, another story for another time. But in Elberton, that's the largest, they, uh, that's the largest granite uh, they, 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 they cut the largest amount of granite in the world. This small town in North Georgia, they cut the most granite, they supply the world with the most granite. Right here, just north of Atlanta, maybe an hour and a half, two hours north of Atlanta. So you got to think, if you have all of this granite, you know, right here, and Atlanta being, when you go up on Stone Mountain, you see that Atlanta really is a forest. So you're really in a forest. You're really in nature with this granite crystal rock, this stone. You know what I mean? And that's what time it is. Like it's time for us to, you know, start to spend more time in nature. You know, it's time for us to, you know, really commune with nature. I spend a lot of time, you know, uh, they have certain waterfalls here in, in Atlanta that you can just go and, you know, sit out on. If you go to my Instagram page, you'll see, you know, I did, I uh, took a picture uh, a couple of weeks ago and I called it Sunday service where 
there's a uh, there's a place here in Atlanta called the Cascade Nature Preserve, and there's a waterfall, and there's these big boulders, and people are just sitting out, you know, eating food, just relaxing, just communing with nature, and that's the thing that we're going to have to do in order to stay rooted, in order to stay grounded, in order to be able to hear the ancestors' voice when they're speaking. Because right now with so much clutter, there's so much distraction. We got these in our hand 24 hours a day. You know what I mean? So we, you know, we're plugged into those and that's the distraction. That's the major distraction. But, you know, when you go to my Instagram page, you'll see, you know, I called it, you know, Sunday service in ATL. You know, people are just chilling. You know, you go in, you know, you 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 give the ancestors certain uh, certain uh, offerings. You know, when you go there, you'll see um, pineapples in the water. You'll see oranges in the water. You'll see flowers in the water. You'll see people making offering to the ancestors, and that's our real culture. You know what I'm saying? That's who we are. So that's what we have to connect back to to really gain our power again. So. Um, so yeah, so I, you know, I say all that to say that, you know, uh, Stone Mountain is a very powerful place. There was a reason that uh, Martin Luther King <laughs> said from Stone Mountain in Atlanta, Georgia, in his speech. You know, wow. so. I, I just wanted to add too about Stone Mountain. <clears throat> a lot of people don't know it, but there is a grant, I was told there's a granite mantle that runs all the way from the mountain under, through all the way to underground Atlanta. So all of downtown Atlanta, all of the you know metro urban areas, all un, you know got that mantle supporting it. Of yeah, Atlanta. yeah. And so that's what you know. That's what makes Atlanta special, and that's why a lot of people are, you know, being attracted. I think to Atlanta now, and uh, you know, so yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a special time right now. We can really, you know, not be afraid and stand in our power, stand on truth, allow the ancestors to guide us. I just, uh, you know, my mom just transitioned in January of this year. And, um, you know, it's a bittersweet moment, but it's like, you know, I know she's an ancestor now guiding me. So, you know, that's that's the time that we're in now. We need to be able to sit still and, and listen to them, you know, as they guide us through these uh, these challenging times that lie ahead. True, 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 true. You know, so that's what really, uh, that's my why. That's what really sparks my storytelling. You know, the, the, the love and the uh, compassion that I have for my people and seeing, you know, us reclaim our, our, our throne and uh, actually put things in order, you know, on this planet again, because there's a lot of things that, you know, have been displaced from, you know, the woman being, you know, in her proper seat, the black woman <laughs> being in her proper seat and, uh, you know, really putting things in order again, because she's the nurturer and she's going to you know, she's going to put those things in, in, in order. She's going to restore uh, balance right now. And that's that's what's needed right now, you know, during these times. You know, it's, it's, it's a crazy time, you know, when I look at the things that are being celebrated. And not to really, you know, talk about anyone, but when we just take a step back and look at what's being celebrated in the world right now, we say, wow, there's something out of, that's, that's not in balance with nature. You know, when we're celebrating such buffoonery, you know what I mean? When we're celebrating and whatever that is, I mean, you know, and it just progressively gets worse. I mean, you look at, you know, a show that's supposed to be as classy and dignified as the Oscars and now just turning into, you know, a slapping contest, you know what I mean? I mean, it's, that's the time we're living in, but the thing is, let's not get caught up in it. You know, let's not get distracted by that. Let's spend quiet time nurturing our spirit. Brother, Brother Rick, um, at, at our church, we have uh, four holy books and one of them is uh, Stolen Legacy. 
And in Stolen Legacy, it has the 10 virtues. Mm -hmm. And uh, the last two are cultivate the ability to tell right from wrong and cultivate the ability to tell the real from the unreal. Yes. Yes. Yes, indeed. Yeah, exactly. So, uh, so yeah. So, I mean, I'll, uh, I'll share Black Friday, the trailer from Black Friday, too. We have about nine minutes left. Yeah. Yeah, this is a, I think this is another 60 second trailer here. All right. So I'll share that one. And uh, we'll conclude with any other uh, questions. No, oh, hold on. living legacy. We are offering seven practical principles to help you build your legacy. It's going to be great. It's going to be awesome. And most of all, fantabulous. Who is, that little, who is that little girl? Who that, that was little Kennedy girl? Stewart. Kennedy Stewart is now, uh, at that point, she was, how old was Kennedy then? About 11, 12 years old. So now, yeah, she, Kennedy is about 16 years old right now. So That's she's priceless. Like, wit. Yeah, she's smart as a whip and doing some amazing things right now. Yeah. All right. We have about seven minutes left. Are there any more questions before we, fantastic, uh, 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 really great, uh, Brother Rick Mathis. Thank uh, you, thank you. And we, we, we enjoyed you coming and, and we want to look, we want to keep in touch with you uh, mm -hmm. to see what you're doing. And, and, uh, and uh, yeah, I, I, I love, I love uh, the, the films and I love your explanation and I love, I love the entrepreneurship that you're, that you're uh, uh, doing. Are there any other questions we have for Brother Rick before he, before he, uh, before we sign off? Anyone else? Any closing remarks you have for us, Rick? Oh, uh, Sister Judy has her hand up. Yes, I, I didn't. I wanted to make sure everyone else had a chance, but I, I have a question. You mentioned Rick the Bi Black. Now we recently had Delvino uh, Wilson. Uh, can't remember Debrano um, yeah, here. Yeah, and, I yeah. know that's and he's featured in the film. Uh, yeah, I know you're talking about. He's in, but now I thought you mentioned, isn't there another Buy Black movement? I was saying We Buy Black, the one okay. with Sharif, We Buy Black. Can you tell us just very, in a few seconds, what is what is that one about? What's so We Buy Black is basically the same thing. It's um, they uh, sell black products that are made by black black businesses. And uh, they have a store. If you if you Google it, you know you'll you'll be able to see what that is. We buy black. You know, it's a young brother that started it named uh, Sharif. Okay. And mm -hmm. my final question was, how would you? What would you say about the movie industry in Atlanta? You know, um, many people may not know, but I guess Californians have been knowing movies were made in Los Angeles forever. But now I think in Atlanta. They may be making more movies. I've heard uh, there are more studios. I saw a few shoots last night ride through the city. Um, what would you say about the movie industry in Atlanta? And I'm sure it attracts a lot of screenwriters, producers, filmmakers. Do you see, Is it? does it seem to be benefiting or opening doors for African-Americans? Well, I, I would say this. Um, 
the movie industry is really relocating from New York to Atlanta, <laughs> from LA to Atlanta. You're seeing a lot of people uh, flock here for productions. And the thing that they're saying is that, you know, in Atlanta, you can create LA, you can create New York, you know, you can create these scenes that you need in Atlanta, in the state of Georgia, because you have, uh, the landscape here is very different, you know? So that could be true. But my take on it is, uh, again, it goes back to Stone Mountain. I feel the people that are producing the films know the energy, know the portal that is opening here in Atlanta. And they know that um, if they're going to, you know, control the power that they're going to have to use the energy, this vortex of energy that's here to project these negative images and these negative stories, you know, that's being told. So I think it's more so when, when it comes to the move, the, uh, the reason why the movies are being, are moving here, you know, I think it's really just the energy, the portal that's open here. That's one answer, um, you know, in terms of, you know, the opportunities, uh, I always say like right now in the time and age that we're in, uh, it's really about who has the best story, like who can be the most creative because we're in a time right now where we could create our own project, market it and take it directly to the consumer ourselves. You know, the gatekeepers are out to lunch. There are no more gatekeepers. The thing that you have to do is you have to work hard and you have to be creative and, uh, and then you can, uh, you can, create some of those same opportunities here, you know? So my thing is, you know, the movies that are being created here, a uh, majority of them are, you know, showing images that I oppose. So I'm really not trying to be a part of their storytelling. My thing is to tell our own stories and show us in a light where we get to determine who's the hero at the end. I'm tired of, you know, the black hero always getting killed before the movie is over. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm tired of, you know, the, the thug movies. You see the black person, they in prison, they in jail. You know, Lil Pookie just got out of jail and, you know, now he going back to the block and now he got to try to survive. You know, that narrative, we've seen that. We've done that. Let's tell some stories. You know, we have great stories that, 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 that need to be told from our heroes. You know what I mean? From people that were already free in this country, from you know, the great things that we did in this country and across this planet, you know, so let's tell some of those stories. Those are the stories that I'm excited and motivated to tell. All that other stuff, I could care less about it. Wow. Before we, before we close, we have an announcement from uh, Minister Amadi. Minister Amadi, would you uh, share your announcement with us and whatever? Oh, else yeah. Um, so, yeah, I just want to remind everybody about the ASCAT conference that it is going to be Friday. And I put the link in there again. And so it's uh, actually free, but if you want to, um, but they do want people to join. This is the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations, ASCAC. So I just wanted to, you know, give you guys one last reminder. And then my question was, um, so, you know, I, I thought it very interesting, uh, you know, what you were talking about in terms of, you know, telling, telling our story and, um, you know, in creating content, and you said that you have classes or something on that, or, you know, like, how could we um, avail ourselves of this kind of training if that's what we, you know, it seems like to me that's very interesting and necessary. Yeah, so uh, you can follow me on Instagram or Facebook, send me a message there um, to at Rick Mathis, or you can email me at I am Rick Mathis at Gmail, and uh, my team will get back with you and, uh, you know, we'll, uh, We'll make it happen. But yeah. All that's, right. That's hey, brother. Thank you. This is a wonderful presentation. Sure. Thank you. I know I'm sure. not. I just, you know, I'm a minister and okay. I, you know, and I think it's, you know, part of my, uh, you know, process of, you know, when I talk about, you know, black sovereignty or is, you know, that part of what we have to do to become sovereign individuals is to tell our own stories. <laughs> and so, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think we need to become very skillful and telling yeah. stories. And so when you said that, that piqued my ear, right? It's like, okay, you know, this is, uh, and then as a minister, we're mm -hmm. always marketing ourselves, you know, for yeah. either this or that. So yeah. I just so thought it'd be very relevant. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you definitely can benefit from, you know, the content creation, 
you know, yeah. and, uh, in, in that formula and that, that system that I have. Uh, you know, the thing is now, uh, media is very important. Media is very powerful. Media controls the minds of the masses. Right. You know, anytime there's a war going on, one of the first things that they do is take control of the media. Why do they do that? Because they want to dictate what message is being put over the airway. You know, are we winning the war? Who's winning the war? Who's right. winning the war? <laughs> you know, how much money is being spent? You know, who just got bombed? I don't know if y'all y'all have seen it, uh, but you know, it was some fake images that was posted about the Ukraine war. You yeah. know what I'm saying? In an effort to uh, create a certain narrative. So it's a it, media is very powerful and very important, which is why I chose to get in this lane because I feel that one of the tools, if we're gonna be, you know, if we're gonna wake up as a people, one of the mediums or one of the tools that has to be used to really get the word out and to awaken us is media. You know, if you look at the griots and the griots, you know, back in the day, uh, you know, that's what that was their thing. They were storytellers, so they would pass down you know, the stories from one generation to the next when they would get in the circles and they would share those stories. So, I mean, media is very important. Like it's, it's everything, everything. Thank you. I'll be sending, I'll probably be sending an email, you know, to get some more information on it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. I want to Remember thank the brother Spell Rick. Spell your name, Spell your name for everybody. Uh, yeah, so I put it in the chat, but I'll put it in the and there again is RIC math is RIC without the K M A T H I S. So uh, I just put it as at Rick Mathis. And um, yeah, definitely follow me. And you can follow us at uh, B1 the movie, which will be uh, sharing a lot of information about uh, upcoming screenings. Uh, we're definitely planning. A big premiere again, Judy, for the Atlanta area for B1, the movie. That's where we'll be premiering it uh, with Dr. Boyce Watkins and some other people. So uh, we'll be making those announcements real soon, uh, as well as, you know, releasing that trailer. That was one of the versions of, of the trailer. We'll have a few different versions uh, of the trailer. So definitely be on the, on the lookout for that. So, you know, we got some exciting things on, on the horizon that I'm really proud about. And uh, definitely excited and honored to uh, to partner with uh, Dr. Boyce Watkins on this project. We want to thank Brother Rick uh, Mathis for such a great presentation. Uh, an independent vis visual storyteller, adept in areas of photojournalism and video production. Thank you for sharing with us this uh, this. This uh, Black Knowledge Matters will be out uh, next, uh, excuse me, tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So look for it then. You can you can replay it. And again, thank you, sir, for joining us. And uh, we're with you. Keep thank keep you. up the good work. Glad glad to know you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, next week, time. everyone, we will be talking about the African origin of Easter with yours truly. Minister Mhotep. So we're we're looking forward to seeing you next time. Uh, glad to see everyone. Keisha, wow, my goodness, <laughs> Ikena and, and Gina, all all the people, brother Jeff, etc. Everybody, see you next time. See you Live next up. time. Guidance and protection, everyone. Peace.